I know a lot of people are curious to hear what you've been up to and your side of the story. You haven't done a lot of interviews recently, huh? No, not really. I've been like cranking things up, like getting ready to start cranking things up a little bit. I do have a, a book coming out. I, and actually just over a month. The last time the Juggalos really heard from you was 2006 when you stepped down from Psychopathic. Am, am I getting the chronology right? Yeah, that's correct. I remember hearing the announcement that you were working on other things, wanting to try new stuff. But I'm curious to hear your side of the story. Well, we could probably spend about 48 hours on this. I don't know what the current narrative is, what like the Juggalos think actually like how I met those guys and knew those guys. But I had initially, first I met Rob, we went to high school together. And from there, he introduced me to Joe and then Joey and then Billy and then like everybody that most people would know or have heard of. And we were like a, a crew of friends, man. And that lasted at least a couple of years of uh, high school, maybe two, three years before the whole ICP thing started, you know what I'm saying? And we had a bunch of really cool adventures. And then we started doing the whole uh, psychopathic records thing. We decided, all right, we're gonna do the six Jokers cards and it's gonna be super dope. I was just like, yeah, that's cool. So I committed to that. Ironically enough, you can't make this shit up. It took 17 years. I've always been in gaming. I mean, I used to have a whole arcade in my basement. I always wanted to get into gaming. When I retired, I opened up a, a gaming business. And it's been doing uh, really well for me. And my passion has been gaming. Now, in 2024, I actually ended up writing a book. They wanted to do the cards. We did the cards. Uh, I was like, mission accomplished. Some people think that I was just like the business guy that came along. And no, that's not the correct story. We were like all best friends from high school. There was like speculation about financial issues and stuff that came up much later. I'd never heard your side of it. Absolutely, positively, in no way, shape, or form did I ever take one fucking penny out of those guys' pockets ever. You understand? So when a crime's committed, the first thing they're gonna be like, what is the motive? So what is the motive? We were like all best friends. They were making a metric ton of money. I was making a metric ton of money. So what is it about? I'm not happy with my metric ton. Let me go over here and try to get four or 500 pounds of cash out of their pile. Like, why? For what, man? The original narrative that a lot of juggalos fell in love with is the true narrative. It was a band of brothers that came out of utter fucking poverty that were like, no matter what, we're going to fucking freak this shit and take this shit. And we did. And it was an absolutely amazing time in music history that's never, ever, nothing like that, especially with the internet, nothing like this will ever fucking happen again. And nothing happened fucking before. Now, I'm not going to sit here and rewrite reality. Was there some type of fucking fall out yeah obviously of course but well after the fact after the fact those years were magic years and those years truly what the juggalos thought they were they absolutely were no there wasn't this one other guy that was some type of traitor and a thief that's just, that's just utter fucking crap bro like when i heard that i'm like what is this so I, yeah. called up, I called rob up i'm like what is this he was just like no nah, the guys have their suspicions and it's just like suspicion and was just like, that's not how it goes. I was just like, I've never fucking been called, asked a question, an email, nothing. Like, nothing ever. Like, I had no fucking clue that there was any thought of anything other than everything is cool. I'd go to gaming conventions with Rob. Like, all the way up to 2019 was, like, the last one. I'm always like, mm. tell Joe and Joey I said hi. And I'm also, how are the guys? Oh, they're doing pretty good. You know, this or that. He's like, okay. Tom, you said hi. And then in 2020 or whatever, on the shoot interview, like, I got lit. I got lit the fuck up, to be honest. It was like a hell of a surprise. It was just like, what is up with this? I remember the Opie, Opie and Anthony thing. It was like there was merch bills that weren't paid for. Did you ever hear that? That was the thing that, like, it confused me. Merch I, so I, yeah. I, I did hear... A little bit about that. Psychopathic is a massive beast. There's no clean break. There's always going to be 
whatever, let's just say X amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars in any time that the liability that's passed due. But there's like also hundreds of thousands of dollars in receivable, like records that you've sold, merch that you've sold, but the check is on its way. So it all balances out. You understand? It's a living, breathing machine. Your quarterly statements, you always want to be in the black, but sometimes if you do a tour or there's like production costs, you recoup that later in the year. I heard, I, I did hear that. That day, fuck it. I thought that was hilarious. I thought that was like a work. The guys were like fucking screaming at the top of their lungs. They were sounding like a wrestling skate. They were giggling underneath their voice. I was just like fucking whatever. They're just on there fucking around. But the shoot interview was just like, wait a fucking minute. <laughs> Is this serious? You know what I'm saying? That took me, that, that definitely fucking rug me the wrong way for sure. I knew, like, had family members that were super fucking sick with fucking COVID. My business in Cali was fucking shut down. Just like everybody. Like, I don't know anybody that had a good 2020. And it was just, what else is happening in 2020? Oh, cool. Fucking me and ITP are completely falling out now. Okay, awesome. So, Alex, what would you say to them about that, what they said? I would say to them, out of any crime you could think of, this crime is the easiest to prove. So if it was me and I had a business partner and they had moved on, if there was any suspicion of something fucking being sideways, you spend fucking four or five grand on an auditor, not one, not two, not three, but 10 super skinny fucking ninjas with heads as big as fucking space aliens come into your fucking office with big thick Coke bottle glasses and they crunch numbers and they go through fucking everything and they look at every fucking thing. And at the end, they're like, yeah, fucking some money's missing. Or they're like, no, nah, all your books fucking balance out. Everything's the code. So this is like the one thing that it's just like, if there's any fucking question, just like audit the books. So that's it. So I'm just like saying, they had all the books. When I sold the business, you can ask anybody that knows anything about business. There's two types of sales. You can do an asset sale where it's just the paperwork stays and, the bank account doesn't transfer, or then you can do what they call a true business sale, which is what I did because I had nothing to hide. They got the bank account. They got all the records. Actually, me and Billy had to sign joint tax returns all the way going to 2010, up to four years after I fucking left. So he would go over them and I would go over them. So I don't get that at all. So what you're saying is you got love for them. But if they want to open a spreadsheet, you're down to share a collaborative document or show the data so that you can clear the beef. So it's not just speculation, right? Books. Bring in the auditor. They want to talk to me. Any question they want, I'll answer. I got nothing to hide. Yeah, there doesn't need to be any speculation. But I'll tell you what, they're not going to find a fucking penny missing because I didn't take anything. And when a crime is committed, the first thing we have to ask is what is the motive? Why? We're like, we were all fucking great friends. Like I said, I wasn't just some business guy that they met. We were all friends in high school. Man, we, I went to war with those guys so many times. Back in the day, shit would just happen. The first time I got arrested was on some shit. This guy, Frank, was at this uh, party, and he was like the party boss. And some shit happened where he was like mad foul to like Joe and to Rob. And I uh, had everybody like at a party, like gang up on them and chase them and beat them down. So it was like out and out war. So and I was like the only one that like had a car. So we went by the guy's fucking house in the middle of the night and we completely fucking fucked it up. And then we got uh, busted by the cops. And I went to jail for the first time in my life. So they tried getting me with like up to fucking five years, like a uh, probation. No prison, just like a, a shitload of probation because I was like, I just turned 18. And I ended up getting fucking a lawyer and I ended up getting that completely down to like fucking time served, which is the overnight that I served in jail. And yeah, it was just, you know, those were my boys, man. We had adventures together. A lot of good times. A lot of good times. You guys, you rode for each other. They made you a beanie boy or whatever. They made you a, they, there's a toy of you. Everyone in the community knew you from shockumentary and everything. And I know it's sometimes not that easy, but do you ever see clearing the air? And does that seem possible when the truth's out there and the love could be back? Bro, 
If you would ask me that as a 20-year-old man or a 30-year-old man, I'd say, fuck no. As a 50-year-old man, I'll tell you what. I would say definitely fucking possible because I've seen too much shit. You just, you, you just never fucking know. Yeah, I would like to be on good terms with them, of course. But, you know, we have to fucking move past what the fucking current discrepancy is. I, I don't have an axe to grind. I'm cool. And they're just like, yeah, okay. If we're cool with them, yeah, we can move forward. We're in this era where we look back at when there was like a monoculture and a singular way through which we found out information, right? You said this at the beginning of our interview. You said this could never happen again in terms of like pop culture and pre-internet and everything that's come together. Could the psychopathic empire have been as huge without the whole Disney controversy? Yeah. So let me just tell you this. Fucking this would have happened. Psychopathic would have happened and ICP would have happened with or without uh, the Disney controversy. Every fucking record that we were working fucking from uh, Dog Beats to Carnival of Carnage to Ringmaster to Riddle Box. We were getting 5X to 10X fucking growth any fucking way. Each album, 5X to 10X growth anyway. So why would that not be the same, you know, with or without the fucking Disney controversy? It might have accelerated it. I mean, we might have gotten to a million a year sooner than just grinding it out. But either way, that album would have went platinum. That's an interesting perspective because the David and Goliath story is the central narrative of independent hip hop and punk rock and like all the fringe groups that take the informative influence they have on culture and normalize it, right? And like you were there on the ride seeing them hand out CDs and do all the promotion from a grassroots level. And because you were so close to the art, I'm curious, do you have a favorite song or a favorite Joker's card from your memories? Yeah. My favorite song is probably Bugs on My Nuts. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's just got it's just cool, man. It's just fucking cool. The guy's rock. I don't know. Everybody has their own. I don't know. I would say in my opinion, the best Joker's card is probably Real Box. Mm. But I'm sure you could probably put ten other people on the fucking mic and sit there and hotly contest that. Everybody has their own thing. A lot of people are going to tell you great Malenko, but then it's also like for a lot of the juggalos, like the first experience they've had with ICP. It just depends. It's just all opinion based. I think it's really cool to hear that you're at, at, in your heart a peacemaker and you just want the truth to come out and you have a lot of reverence for what you described as a magical time. And I think that that's dope, man. That's like a very spiritual bro, you, perspective. Bro, you, can check, you, you can check the internet, man. Yeah. Like I've never, ever said anything bad about ICP. I mean, I'm telling you, man, like, it, that was that that was a 20, maybe just 2020 was just a negative trash curse here. But yeah, that, that was a surprise. That was definitely a surprise. Let's talk about your book and, like, the appearances you're doing. And you sent me a cool video. I want to drop it right now. I am the last of Animosus Knights. My entire order has vanished. There's no one left but me now. A man, 500 years out of time. It is fate itself that has brought me here. I sense a terrible darkness upon this new land that is ready to consume all. This new world is full of ignorance. They can do nothing to stop the horrors to come. I am all alone, but I am not afraid. It is my sworn duty to protect me. I must act now, but if I fail, I fear all of humanity will fail with me. But there is one thing that is in my favor, the one path that can always bring victory. I call upon all of my trouble. I call upon all of the lost knowledge of the ancient world. I call upon horsemanship and swordsmanship, craft and creation, honor and valor, wisdom and justice, life and the light, the chivalrous heart. So tell yeah. me more about the story. This was awesome. I've been writing like adventures 
since I was a little kid, literally for 40 years, I've been like dungeon mastering and, and yeah, and role playing like dun- and DMing and GMing, which is game mastering other games. And yeah, and I've been like building worlds and that's almost the same thing. You build in a world and I don't, the characters, the players go through the world and the villains and these are the circumstances and their abilities. And I've been doing it professionally for the last 25 years at various conventions. And I'm getting stand-in ovations. And people are just like, man, you, I, I was having the worst convention until I played your game. And they're just like, man, your ideas and your style. I'm like, you, you're really talented. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. And everyone's just, you ever write anything? I've been getting that pretty much for the last 20, 25 years. So I was just like, you know what? So in 2020, 2021, when everything was all shut down and depressed, I didn't really have much else to fucking do. A lot of people had a lot of time on their hands. I just started writing and I went through my notes and I came up with some of the best plot elements from all the stories I ever wrote. And I wrote a 100-page graphic novel called Chivalrous Arts. Everything cool has arts at the end. What can I tell you? Dark <laughs> arts, mystic arts, martial arts, fighting arts. So chivalrous art. So basically chivalrous is like all the night combat shit with the horses and then arts. And yeah, and I got that. I actually was able to get that uh, approved by the U.S. government. So I own that. That's my trademark. Tell you what, man. So I worked on this story for about uh, a year and a half. Because I was like, I'm not just, I'm going to fucking put out a book, man. It's, I mean, it's got to have some like innovations. I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but I'll tell you this. Don't let anybody, if you intend to buy the book, do not let anybody ruin the ultra, ultra amazing surprise ending. I'm telling you, and that hook and the, at the end of the book, uh, you, there's nothing to compare it to. There's no movie. There's no fucking video game that you've played. There's no TV series. There's nothing like this hook until this book drops. And then anybody that copies it, they're like, oh, you ended it with a chivalrous art style fucking hook. Because they're going to have to jack my shit. Yeah. <laughs> and you know this day and age where literally there's been like hundreds of thousands of video games, tens of thousands of TV shows, tens of thousands of movies to actually try to fucking cut some new ground. It's not easy. But I feel that I did it. You worked with some illustrators, like, or one specific one? Or what was the production process like? Yeah. So... I searched and searched. I found this guy uh, named Ryan. And yeah, his God's just blessed his hands, boy. I don't know what to tell you. The book is an utter masterpiece. And he just was just like that he drew it. And we were going to have someone else ink it. And he just had too much love for the title. So he's just, you know what? Fuck it. I'll ink it. So he inked it. Yeah. And uh, man, just the fights, the inks, the action. Yeah, it just fucking it came out like way better than I ever thought. I'm really excited to get it out there and and see how it does. Who knows if it ends up fucking hitting it up? And who knows? Maybe I can get it fucking animated. I'd love to have a fucking animated series. It's interesting, Alex, because you talked about how we're all world builders. At the end of the day, it's like the nerds are the creative people who t- tell the stories, turn our pain into something beautiful that connects us all. And that's the power of music. And that's the power of art and writing. And so it's really cool that you've been on this path where you're like, you're, you're world building and continuing to do it in realms outside of music. Yeah, I can't, bro. The amount of talent, you know, that was in Psychopathic Records, the original core, and everybody, Billy, Rob, Joe, Joey, you know, myself, the amount of talent, just everybody there is super smart, super fucking talented. And uh, yeah, I mean, it shows. I mean, moving on from this, if you believe this or not, I'm actually working on a board game and a role play game all under the same title. I just figured that I might as well start out with the lore. People can read the story and be like, oh, this is really cool. What's happening is really cool. So that when they play the board game, they'll have something to, to, to think of. And it's not all me. I'm not going to lie. I know some like very powerful nerds. <laughs> that helped me out. Uh, you got some cool things going on for sure. 
Before we wrap up, is there anything else you want to shout out or anything you want to mention until next time? The book's dropping. We got it in a lot of comic book shops on April 24th. Or you can pick it up on the website at Alchemist Elite Comics on Instagram. But either way, pick it up in the store or if you can make it to Astro, then absolutely it will be there along with the limited edition cover and some other show specials that we're going to have. This has been a really exclusive special interview, Alex. I want to thank you for your time. I think we cleared a lot of stuff up and it's good to know it's all love, all positive. So thank you. Yeah, bro. That's the only way to move forward and that's the correct way to move forward. And it's all good, man. Oh, uh, yeah, man. It's been so dope talking to you, man. Yeah, maybe we can have a part two sometime. That's what's up. I appreciate that, man, and I'll talk to you soon.